So today we are, uh, this might be a little bit of a boring sermon, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, but no, I want, actually there is a, a good overall message. This morning I wanted to take a bird's eye view of the book of Philippians. Uh, as, when we look at the book of Philippians as a whole, there is a very good uh, central message here uh, about being Christ-centered. Uh, that's, that's what basically the whole book of Philippians is about. Every chapter uh, has a different Christ-centered focus uh, in, their, in each chapter. Um, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, and we're just going to read verses 1 and 2 here. Uh, this is Paul's uh, introduction or his greeting. Uh, it says, and starting at verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful church. And uh, I thank you for your word, Lord, and uh, the words of encouragement here. Uh, and I just pray, Lord, that you allow uh, our hearts and our minds to be opened up and, and allow this to sink in and to uplift our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, the book of Philippians is a very uplifting book. Uh, there's not one mention of sin in the book of Philippians. Uh, is, the book of Philippians also talks about joy all the time, and Christ is mentioned throughout uh, this book. Uh, the reason why is because the Philippian church was actually doing very well. Uh, they were doing a very good job, and even when we get it, when you get into the book of Revelation, uh, the Philippian church is commended by Jesus Christ. And so, uh, this is there were very good things going on here, uh, and Paul is giving this letter of encouragement to them and thankfulness uh, for them. And so, before we get into this, one of the things that I like to do uh, before. Get diving into a book on my own study, just kind of bringing you guys into the way I study a book, uh, is I like to ask what's called the five-point question rule. Uh, the five-point question rule. Uh, and that rule is basically who is speaking, uh, who are they speaking to, uh, what is it about, uh, what is, when was it spoken, uh, and what is the occasion, right? And so uh, let's go ahead and go through these five questions here uh, before we really get into this. And so first, a couple of these questions are actually answered in those first couple of verses. Uh, who's, who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? Uh, and so first, the writer of the book of Philippians or the, the letter to the Philippian church, uh, it is Paul, okay? So don't be confused. It, even though it says Paul and Timothy, uh, at, in that, those first verses, Paul is very much the writer of the book of Philippians. Uh, he wrote this under the inspiration of God. Um, and so, uh, again, not Timothy. Uh, the reason why Timothy is mentioned here is the Philippian church would have been familiar uh, with Timothy, and Paul was actually going to send Timothy to them, as he mentions later in this book. And so, uh, Paul is definitely the writer. Uh, he uses personal uh, pronouns throughout the whole thing. Uh, he uses words like I, you know, and my, and uh, so he is, it, it's a very personal letter from Paul to them. Uh, Paul was actually the one that um, helped establish this church, so uh, in his second missionary journey, and we'll get into that in a moment. One of the awesome things here. In your Bibles, if you have the, the King James uh, or if you have the New King James, uh, if you have the King James, it'll say servant there when he talks about himself. And in the New King James, it says bond servant. Uh, understand that the Greek word there, uh, we've talked about this a couple of times, is the word doulos or douloi uh, here. And the Greek word douloi means uh, servant, but not um, like a hired servant. This was a bond servant was someone that sold themselves into servitude. Uh, a good equivalent for this, that if, we, if you understand American history at all, uh, was indentured servitude. And so this is not quite slavery, but it is very close to that. You, are sold, you basically have sold yourself into servitude. 
And so Paul, when he's talking about himself in relationship to Christ, he's saying, I am this bondservant. Christ owns me. And so that's, that's an awesome thing to think about. And Paul refers to himself as that uh, fairly often uh, in his writings. And so I just wanted to point that out there, that if you are really following, to, following Christ to the best of your ability, you should think of yourself as this bondservant of Christ. That Christ really holds your salvation and he owns you. Uh, that is a, a beautiful thing. And so now the audience, the audience here. Uh, the, the audience is very obviously uh, the saints uh, in Philippi. Okay, the saints in Philippi uh, who are with, with the bishops and deacons. It, again, it answers that uh, in those first couple of verses. But there are some things that we have to understand here about who those people were. Um, so first of all, the, the saints in Philippi. So first, we have, in, in understanding that, uh, first we have to look at the city of Philippi. Okay, The city of Philippi. Uh, Philippi was a very big city. Uh, it's not some little town. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, uh, when Paul was going to go there, uh, it says this in verse 12. It says, and from there, there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. So that is Luke there uh, talking about the city of Philippi. He says it is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia. Now, uh, the capital of Macedonia at that time, I believe, was Thessalonica, but... Philippi was another big city. Now, it also says that Philippi was a colony there. And what that means is this city was, would have been like a mini Rome. So it was a colony of Rome, and it was a very big city. And so everything that we can think of about Rome probably would have also been going on in Philippi. And so not the best city, but a very good church in this city. Um, and so, again, this would have been a, ma a mini Rome. Now, let's look at the church in Philippi. What do we know about this church before the letter of Philippians? Uh, all of our information about the church in Philippi uh, before this point uh, comes from the book of Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 16. Um, I'm not going to turn there, but I'll describe to you basically what happens. This is the founding of that church. And so... Uh, the church in Philippi was established as a result of Paul's visit during his second missionary journey there. And so this is accounted for in Acts chapter 16, like I said. Uh, we know who the early membership would have been uh, based off of what Paul did there. Uh, its early membership would have included Lydia and her family. So this was a woman um, that sat under Paul's teachings and her and her family were all baptized because, because of that. And so uh, her and her family would have been members. Um, and then also the, there was a, a demon-possessed girl uh, that Paul cast out the demons from. Uh, but then he's arrested as a result of that uh, and goes to jail. And, but he's singing praises the whole time while he's in jail. And so this jailer... And his family end up getting saved and baptized. And so uh, we know that Lydia and her family and also the jailer and his family would have been members of that early church. Uh, and possibly the previously demon-possessed girl, though we don't have much more information on that. And so we know at the very least th these people were part of that early church there. Uh, it likely would have grown by the time Paul was writing this letter. And so what's awesome about this is, is Paul has a very personal relationship with this church. Uh, he basically established this church there. And so uh, he, this was during his missionary journey. And so he had a very close connection with them. And so that audience is very important. We have to remember that as we go through uh, the letter to the Philippians. Now, the subject of... Uh, the book of Philippians, like the title of this message, is uh, being Christ-centered. And so that is, that is the overarching subject of the book of Philippians. 
So be, focusing on Christ basically in every aspect of our lives, um, both you know, personally and as a church. Uh, now the timing of this letter. Uh, there's some things that Paul says in this letter that are kind of sad if you know the, if you know the end of it. Uh, Paul is writing this letter while he's imprisoned. Uh, and it, he's, we, we know that Paul ends up dying. Uh, but when he's writing this letter to the Philippian church, he's telling them that he's going to send them Timothy until he can come and see them again. And uh, that's, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a sad thing to think about. Paul didn't get to go back to the Philippian church. But uh, so this is during the time that Paul is imprisoned, uh, eventually going to be executed uh, by the Romans. And so the reason for writing now, this book is to encourage the Philippian church. Now, the Philippian church at that time was likely very shooken up by the imprisonment of Paul. And so he is writing this letter to them uh, to talk about how you know, God is working this stuff together for good. Uh, and he's writing this letter to them to encourage them. And so this very much is a letter of encouragement to the Philippian church. Uh, we can see this in Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 11. It says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in, the knowledge, or sorry, in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, or sorry, Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. And so he wants, so they're doing good, right? But he's praying that their love for God may abound more and more, uh, and the knowledge may grow, right? And so he wants them to continue growing. So he's encouraging them to keep on going on the road that they are going. So now getting into the content of the book of Philippians. And this is where we're going to kind of, if you want an overview of what I'm going to be preaching about for the next few months, um, it's a good thing you're here today. So I'm not saying don't show up, uh, but uh, please come in. Remember, we're taking a bird's eye view right now. Uh, but in the coming weeks, we're going to take a look at each of these uh, subjects very uh, closely. And so Philippians chapter 1 is all about a Christ-centered mission, a Christ-centered mission. Uh, this is really Paul kind of describing uh, what has been going on with him, and he's giving advice to the Philippian church based off of that uh, to, you know, he's basically saying, take my experiences and apply them to yourselves. And so uh, this Christ-centered mission. And so the first part of Philippians chapter 1 in this is Paul's thankfulness to his, for his fellow servants of Christ. And so the very first part of being Christ-focused, if we look at this book, is all about thankfulness to God for what he's put you into and what you know, your fellow Christians are doing also. So be thankful for the service that you are doing for God. Uh, it's the first part of being Christ-focused. Philippians 1.3 uh, when he's talking to the Philippian church, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. That's a beautiful thing. So Paul is praying for this church, uh, but he says every, basically every time he thinks about this church in Philippi, he says, I thank God upon every remembrance. That's, that's a beautiful thing. So this, this, these people left such an impact on Paul that every time he thought about them, he was thankful to God for them. Now, we should remember this and be thankful for our fellow workers in Christ. Uh, every time we think about other people in our church uh, working for Christ, every time we, we hear about things that are going on at other churches, you know, we, we should never scoff at the success of other churches. We should be thankful for their success because they're working hard as well, right? And so uh, we should thank God upon every remembrance, right? Um, 
Next, he talks about in this chapter uh, how Christ was preached through his own uh, suffering. This is where he's talking about uh, his imprisonment. And remember, the Philippian church is a bit shaken up through this. And so Philippians 1.12, it says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And so can you imagine being the Philippian church and the guy that helped you start your church is now imprisoned and be suffering persecution, right? You'd be kind of shaken up. But and he's now writing this letter to them. He said, no, this is all for the furtherance of the gospel. And so again, that, that message of encouragement, but that should stand out to us that Christ is still preached through suffering. Christ is still preached through suffering. The next thing he says to them, uh, wait, the next thing he talks about to them is living for Christ. And so part of a Christ-focused mission, and I talk about our mission here on earth, is living our lives for Christ. And he later goes on to preach basically a, a whole chapter uh, on this. Uh, but we need to live for Christ. It's a very famous verse. Uh, he says in Philippians 1.21, uh, he says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain, right? And so if you stay, if you're going to stay here on this earth, you are going to, you need to live for Christ. But remember, if you die, it's gain, because where are you going? You're going to heaven. You're going to go be with Christ. And even Paul, when he's talking about this, he, he says, I, I'm split between the two. He goes, I feel like I should remain here with you, but I really, he's basically saying, but I really want to go to heaven. And so uh, Paul is split between his responsibility here on earth uh, and his desire to be with Christ. And so uh, that's why he's saying this, this line here. The last thing he talks about in Philippians 1, uh, he talks about us having conduct worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so living with Christ as our focus, but also understanding that our conduct, our actions here on earth need to be worthy of the gospel. So not just when we're sharing the gospel and telling people about it, but the way we live our lives needs to be worthy of God's word. Uh, Philippians 1.27, it says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, with the, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so having Christ-centered mission means having the whole package, not just preaching the gospel, but living a life worthy of the gospel that we share. The next thing he talks about in Philippians chapter 2. So remember, every chapter has a different Christ-centered message. Chapter 2 is very much a, about a Christ-centered church. And so we're talking about a mission, but now it's a church. Uh, our church needs to have Christ at its center. We should all be focused on Christ. That seems like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised at how often churches aren't focused on Christ and focused on other things going on. But uh, we need to have a Christ-centered church. How do we do this? Uh, basically, <clears throat> Paul is laying out blueprints basically to how to have a Christ-centered church. What does that look like to us? The very first thing that he points out in chapter 2, it kind of continues on from chapter 1, but he points out unity. So the very, the very first thing that Paul points out to us in being Christ-focused as a church is being unified in that. And so Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And so uh, that same love and being like-minded, what is that? That is Jesus Christ, Right? And so we should all be unified based off of our love for Jesus Christ. And so that's the very first thing that he lays out here. The next thing in having a Christ-focused church is we should look at and emulate, so we should be like Christ in this, we should have the humility 
of Christ. And so the, the next part of the chapter, he points out what did it look like for Christ to be humble. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Remember that word bondservant, Duloy? So he's talking about, you know, basically making himself almost a slave, right? Uh, and it says, and coming in the likeness of man. And so Jesus, when he came, did he, did he come, you know, with a halo around him and everything and make it obvious to all of the earth that he was way more powerful and everything? He did miracles, but how did he come? He was born and he was in a manger, right? He was basically born in what basically was a cave, right? And so he came the lowest of the low, basically, to show us God's love. So we need to have, if Christ did that, we need to have that kind of humility as well, not trying to puff ourselves up, but instead making ourselves lowly. Let God lift you up. So we also need to remember that as a church, we are representatives of Christ uh, on this earth. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 uh, and 15, it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So that's, that's a very interesting thing. So Paul talks about the time that they were living in was a very crooked and perverse generation. It was, way, it was really bad back then. Do we really think that the world is any better now? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, but we, among them, shine as lights in the world. That is being a representative of Christ, right? That we need to be this beacon that draws everybody towards Christ. So while we are here as a group, we are representatives. Paul gives uh, a couple of good examples uh, in commending Timothy uh, and Epaphroditus. Now, Timothy and Epaphroditus, you know, they, they were men that Paul was going to send to them. But he talks about how good of a job these men have done. Why does Paul, in the midst of his letter, talk about these two guys who weren't uh, yet with them, right? He was going to send them to, him, to them. Well, because they're good examples for us to strive towards. You see, these men in this church, there, there are some examples of bad men in churches and other books, but these men were really good, shining examples. So right after talking about being representatives of Christ, he talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus, right? These ideals that are laid out here in this book are not out of reach for us. Sometimes we think about the stuff in the Bible, it's like, oh, well, we need to strive towards that. We need to try to have that, but it's, it's out of reach for us, right? We, we, we're just supposed to try. We, we don't, we're, God doesn't really expect us to do that, those things, right? Well, no, because there's examples of men that did that stuff all the time. And so we need to, we need to be like them, right? And so these things aren't out of reach for us. There are examples of men that are like, these, like this. And so, moving on into chapter 3, and Timothy and Epaphroditus are kind of a, when we go through them, they're kind of a good segue uh, into chapter 3. But Philippians chapter 3 is all about having a Christ-centered life, right? So you might be thinking, you know, all these things kind of run together. Yes, they do. They, they all do go together, okay? But we need to have a Christ-centered life. And so the first thing that Paul talks about here in chapter 3, and... I will say in chapter 3, it's kind of funny. Um, this is kind of a joke with preachers. Uh, but don't ever trust a preacher when he says, finally. Because uh, he's probably lying to you. So, <laughs> uh, In Philippians, right, there's four chapters. And so 
if at the very beginning of chapter 3, in other words, there's still two full chapters to go, right? At the very beginning of chapter 3, Paul says, finally, my brethren, and then he goes, so he's only halfway through the, he's only halfway through the letter, but he says, finally. And so anytime you hear me say, in conclusion, I, I might be done, or I might not be, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, just kind of a funny side note there. But the first thing that we should learn from chapter 3 uh, in having a Christ-centered life is where we put our focus. And Paul tells us here that basically that nothing is worthy of our focus more than Jesus Christ. So nothing is worthy of our focus more than Christ. Uh, even the things that we think are uh, essential to church sometimes. You know, I, I bring up music sometimes because that's something that everybody at every church likes to focus on a lot is what kind of music we have. Are we letting that become a bigger thing than Jesus? Because Paul talks about here, you know, with circumcision and that being one of the big things that people, the Jews especially, got hung up on, uh, that you couldn't really be a Christian unless you were part of the circumcision. And Paul's saying, I come from, he came from all of that. And he understood that that all is loss. He counts that all loss compared to the salvation that he has in Jesus. And so Philippians 3 verse 8, it says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Rubbish means trash, right? So all of those things that we think are special, right? Compared to Jesus, they're trash. That our focus needs to be on him and him alone. The next thing he tells them to do is, is to press towards the goal. Press towards the goal, the prize of Christ. Philippians 3.14 says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And so having a Christ-centered life is constantly making ground towards Christ, towards being more and more like Jesus. We should constantly be moving. The minute that you think that you are done growing, I believe that's the minute that God's going to take you off this earth, right? You should never be done growing. You should always be pressing towards the goal. Also, having Christ-centered life. Remember, we, though we may be here on this earth, this might be the place that we are staying right now. Understand that we are not citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven. So having a Christ-centered life means understanding that we don't belong here anymore. We belong in heaven. This is just our waiting place until we get to heaven. And so we need to behave on this earth as if we are citizens of heaven because we are. And so we need to act like it. Philippians 3.20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, for wit, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, I think... In the older, it says our conversation. And the reason why it says conversation there is because uh, that was very much connected to citizenship uh, in the Roman Empire at the time. And so uh, it's a very uh, interesting word there. It doesn't quite mean what we think it means today. But uh, that, that word citizenship is so awesome. It's where we belong. The next part, the last chapter of uh, Philippians... Philippians chapter 4, it said, uh, we need to have a Christ-centered mindset. So we, we talk about having a Christ-centered mission and church and life, but what about our minds? Are, are our minds constantly focused on the things of Christ? There are three base pieces of advice in having a Christ-centered mindset. Paul basically gives three things. Be joyful, be peaceful, and be generous. Be joyful, be peaceful, be generous. 
Part of having a Christ-centered mindset is having those things uh, in your mind all the time. So being joyful, right? Now, a lot of people say, well, Christ wants you to be happy. Does it say anywhere in the Bible that God wants you to be happy? No, we are to have joy. And joy and happiness are two very different things. Happiness is an emotion that comes and goes. Joyful is from within, being, having joy is from within and is what God puts inside you, right? That doesn't go away. And so the kind of, the, the kind of joy that we are to have in God is even when I'm down, right? Even when I am a little bit upset, I can look at my God and know that he is good and understand where I'm going, right? Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Always. Again, I say, rejoice. You see, again, it's not a matter of happiness, right? We can be sad and still be rejoicing in the Lord. You know that? That is, that is a real thing. We can be going through hard times and still understand that our God is good. So we should be focused on that. The next thing is talking about being peaceful, right? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, <clears throat> will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. You know what's awesome about this is, does it say here that if you bring your prayers to God, that God is going to give you everything you ask for? No. What does it say there that you'll get if you pray to God about these things that you are anxious over? The peace of God will come, over, will come to you. That's, that's a promise there. And so sometimes instead of asking for things all the time, we need to be comfortable in God knowing with what we have, right? If we're focused on God, we're not going to be as concerned about all the things that we don't have, right? And so uh, be anxious for nothing, but just have that peace of God, right? The next thing, and Paul commends the Philippian church for this, but be generous, be generous. Generosity is something that is kind of lost on people sometimes today. But we need to be generous. The Philippian church was very generous to Paul. In fact, the only time where they weren't giving to Paul was when they couldn't, when they lacked the opportunity, right? And Paul talks about that there. But as, as long as they had the opportunity, they were helping, right? And so we need to be the same way. Philippians 4 18 through 19. It says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I want to stop there for a second. Paul, Paul is in prison when he is saying this. Okay? So if you think prosperity gospel is a thing, and a lot of people that read these verses here think that they use them for prosperity gospel, understand that the writer, that we, when he's talking about this, he is in prison. Okay? And the, the Roman prisons weren't exactly good places, okay? So uh, he says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma. This is talking about to God, right? The, the, it says, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Who were they pleasing by giving Paul these things? They were pleasing God by giving Paul uh, these things. Then, this is the one that prosperity gospel preachers like to quote because they don't, they don't look at the whole book or the chapter even. Uh, but verse 19 here, it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need. A, the Philippian church is giving a ton in trying to help Paul, 
And he's going through really hard times. And we look through this passage, it's not talking about prosperity here. It's talking about God providing for their needs so that they can keep helping people. And also, this is not a verse that is on a personal level. He is not talking about a per he's not talking to a person. He is talking to a church. And so it's talking about God providing for a church so that they can keep providing for others. So if you read the Bible and you think that God's going to give everything you want in life, absolutely not. Okay? In fact, Jesus says the opposite. There's going to be hard times, right? But the thing, what we have in God is so much better. We, we have eternity to focus on. We have heaven to focus on. So even if, even if we lose everything in this life, we have heaven. That's more than ever, anything we could possibly build up for ourselves that all goes away when we die. The last thing I want to say this morning, and, and I promise this is, this is the end. Uh, I'm not Paul, so. Uh, but a very famous verse, Philippians 4, 13. And having looked at this whole book, we can really understand this verse now. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You, I, you see this on football helmets sometimes, and then they go score a touchdown, and they, they point up to God, like God just gave them that touchdown. And they go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I can go achieve anything. That's not what this verse is about. Remember, Paul is in prison, and he's talking about literally having Christ, being Christ-focused throughout your entire life, throughout everything, being Christ-focused. And so if you are focused on Christ for everything, then you can do all things through Christ, right? And so when it says do all things, it's not talking about achievement there. It is talking about going through life, enduring that is actually what that, that idea that's been get, being given there. It's doing all things, but it's not talking about going and achieving. It's about talking about getting through the things that are happening to you. I can do all things through Christ who, strength, who strengthens me. Why can you do that? Because if you follow this book and follow the things that it teaches, you should already be focused on Christ. And then you can do things through Christ, right? So, in conclusion this morning, as the pianist and song leader come, these are all very beautiful things for a church who was focused on Christ. Remember, Paul is encouraging this church through these things. He's telling them, you have this, but you should grow in it. But if you're here this morning and you're not saved, understand that everything in this book applies to saved individuals. So what you need to do in order to be able to do things through Christ who strengthens you, in order to be able to endure things, you have to first turn to him and accept him as your Lord and Savior. That's what you have to do. Repent of your sins and turn to him as your Lord and Savior. Then, then that endurance comes, right? Then all of these good things that are in fellowship with other people, other Christians, right? Then that comes. But turn to him this morning and accept him as your Lord and Savior. He deserves it. You know, Paul talks about himself as a bondservant. Jesus purchased him. He did that with his blood on the cross at Calvary. Jesus died for each and every one of us. And so we owe him our allegiance. So would you turn to him this morning and repent and turn to him as your Lord and Savior? Do that, and you will spend eternity with him. Do that and you will have this endurance. You'll have this peace that God promises. Do that this morning.